Welcome to Lecture 1 on the Texas Executive Branch. Although the governor is the most visible leader in Texas politics, Texas governors have fewer powers than many governors in other states. Greg Abbott, the current governor, was elected in 2014, and he succeeded one of the more powerful governors in Texas history, Rick Perry. Now, Abbott does not have the amount of control over the state bureaucracy that Perry had through his appointees, but he has had some effectiveness in pursuing a very conservative political agenda. At the same time, he has shown that Texas governor's office can be a powerful means to convey conservative ideas through the political agenda. Abbott has shown himself to be far more than a ribbon cutter as Texas governors were once described. Executive power in Texas is divided and the governor has less formal power than most other state governors. The Constitution of 1876 was a reaction to the power of the executive under Reconstruction. It placed strict limits on the governor's power power was further fragmented among other office holders. Successful governors, therefore, have to be successful politicians. Now the question begs to be asked, why was the power of the governor fragmented? Well, it was because of former Governor Edmund Davis. When the Civil War gripped the country, Davis, like then Governor Sam Houston, opposed succession. Davis led a cavalry regiment for the Union during the war, fighting all over the South and witnessing Confederate General Edmund Kirby Smith surrender in Texas. Now, Davis's wife and children were treated very badly by the Confederates, and Davis himself had narrowly escaped lynching only by the intervention of Mexico. So when the state constitutional conventions were held in 1866 and 1868 to 1869, Davis showed up with some personal and political bones to pick. Now a radical Republican representing the border region, Davis worked to block ex-Confederates, who were largely Democrats, from political power and to expand the voting rights of African-American Texans. In 1869, he defeated a fellow Republican in the race for governor. For a long time, Davis was depicted as a typical scalawag, a derisive term for white Southerners who became Republicans during the Reconstruction era, supposedly out of self-interest. Davis started public schooling in the state, stood up to police forces, and further expanded civil rights for the newly freed African Americans. When he ran for re-election in December 1872, ex-Confederates had regained the right to vote, and Davis got a Democratic opponent, Richard Koch. Voter intimidation, fraud, and other irregularities occurred on both sides, to what degree is really unclear. When Davis lost by a margin of two to one, he declared the entire election invalid. The Texas Supreme Court agreed, but Democrats declared that actually the court was invalid. In mid-January 1873, Koch arrived in Austin to assume the governorship. Davis locked himself inside the governor's office at the Texas Capitol building. Koch and his supporters took over the second floor where he took the oath of office. For two days, there were two governors in power. Armed supporters for both men paced the streets and violence seemed inevitable. When Davis summoned a local militia to protect him, it sided with Koch instead. Davis then begged President Grant, a fellow Republican, to send in federal troops. On January 17th came Grant's reply, no federal troops, and quote, would it not be prudent as well as right to yield to the verdict of the people as expressed by their ballots, end quote. Davis gave up, effectively ending Reconstruction in Texas. There wouldn't be another Republican governor until party realignment almost a hundred years later. But on his way out, he locked the door to the governor's office and took the keys with him. Koch supporters were forced to bust it open with an axe. Texas ranks 41st among the states in overall institutional powers of the governor. Political skills are especially important for Texas governors who want to advance a policy agenda or their political careers. Limited formal powers means that winning public support and taking a leadership role among the state executives is critical. 
A governor with a clear policy agenda in place is better able to direct and lead the legislature. Governors who develop collaborative relationships can realize more goals than the powers of the position would otherwise allow. The specific powers that the Constitution gives the governor basically starts off with they're able to call special sessions of the legislature, they're able to pardon criminals, they have appointment power to appoint people to governing boards and commissions, they have the power to declare martial law, they have the power to veto acts of the legislature. Qualifications. There are three constitutional qualifications to be governor of Texas. First, you have to be at least 30 years old. You have to be an American citizen and you have to live in Texas for five years immediately before the election. Texas governors have tended to be male, white, conservative, Protestant, and middle-aged, and usually they have considerable political experience. There have been two women governors of Texas, Mary Ann Ferguson and Ann Richards. Governors serve four-year terms, which was changed from two years in 1974. George W. Bush was the first governor that was elected for two consecutive four-year terms. Rick Perry served from 2000 through 2014, which was the longest tenure for a Texas governor. Campaigns include first the party's primary and then the general election in November. Sometimes these can last over a year. Campaigns are very expensive, largely due to the size of the state and the multiple media markets. Governor Abbott began his campaign for his third term with $55 million in the bank in June 2021, making his cash on hand larger than that of any other statewide candidate in Texas history. Successful candidates, you know, have to win their party's primary election in March. And during this primary, Abbott faced several notable Republican challengers from the far right conservative wing of the party. Now, elections in Texas, specifically for the executive branch, are held in off years or during the midterm elections. They did this because it was believed that presidential races would adversely affect the gubernatorial race. Uh, in other words, the what they call the... Uh, uh, the coattail effect. If the presidential candidate is, is popular, it could rise up the fortunes of his party or it could lower it. In other words, presidential uh, elections tend to suck all the oxygen out of the room. They didn't want these elections interfering with the elections of the governor. Now, like most midterm races, there is a lower turnout in uh, midterm elections. Now, here we have Table 8.1 that points out the governors of Texas and their terms of office since 1874. Uh, it starts off right after Edmund Davis with Richard Koch, and it goes all the way to 2015 where we have our current governor, Greg Abbott. And we're going to stop there and pick up uh, the rest of the lecture.